Hello. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here. What a wonderful turnout on a uh, melancholy December afternoon. Jesse, I hope you'll uh, lift our spirits. Um, it's really, really always, always an honor to welcome poets of caliber such as Jesse, um, poets with such deep Berkeley roots. Um, before we get started, if everyone could turn off their phones to the degree possible, that would be wonderful. Um, I want to thank briefly our sponsors, uh, as always, the English department. The library gives us so much support, uh, both numerated and affective and this beautiful space. Um, and then the dean's office has been generous in supporting lunch poems. So without further ado, here's our director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Thank you, Noah, and welcome, Jesse. Did you have to walk like a couple of hundred yards to get here? Um, I'm going to talk about rhyme today, um, which is a really dramatic character in um, Jesse's debut book, Egg Tooth, available at the back, courtesy of Pegasus, after the reading. Um, maybe as dramatic a character as the speaker of the poems, although obviously indistinguishable from them to some extent. Rhyme's near disappearance from poetry is an underaccounted for story, but it's one that Jesse Nathan's Egg Tooth tells via Rhyme's startling presence in almost all the poems, most of which borrow a stanza form from John Donne, which sutures an ABAB quatrain scheme to a CCC tercet. Sometimes strict and perfect, sometimes merely assonant, barely there or temporarily gone, I feel the book surveys all the attitudes towards and handlings of rhyme since the 16th century. Um, at one point, the title poem, Egg Tooth, calls this enlivened anachronism half medieval, um, which implies there is another half that is not. Um, one that is deliberately and inevitably contemporary. The resurrection of this kind of verse capacity in the time of its embarrassment makes the classical feel radical. It's re-allowed. The repetition of this stanza form in so many of the poems, in so many variations, also allows readerly expectation to shift from the shock of an initial encounter with such sturdy rhyme that is so out of place and out of time in our moment, and turn instead to a bracing familiarity and an intimate tracking of all the possibilities afforded by rhyme's loud, quiet, loud presence here. It's also a way of linking personal history with the history of a formal feature, dredging up ancient sonic correspondences while also auditing how a person or a poet came to be and comes to be. This is a book about development, but it will not limit itself to one sense of that word, instead preferring to skein together formal structure, personal life, and the domination and division of land in the states. All of these are forms, often painful ones, of becoming that Eggtooth wants to track. At the same time, this use of Dunn's Rhyming stanza tells a story of discrepancy between then and now, between one plan and another, a narrative of near misses and internal rivenness, a four and a three, that itself rhymes with the book's suturing of Kansas and Northern California as sites of development. Rhyme is also thus one of the candidates for the book's title, a little organic disposable tool for getting out of one environment and into another. But unlike a baby bird's instrument, poetry's version never quite drops away here, never outlives its usefulness. Sometimes this history of rhyme and self can be told in a single tercet sonics, as in the last three lines of the title poem, Egg Tooth, which rhyme pay, blade, and fly moving from one sensual logic of corresponding to another. There are technical reasons why those three words can be said to rhyme, but they also rhyme 
because they've been put in the stanzaic and line positions where we now expect them to. That they do is like the book and its account of experience, both shocking and normal, which is to say it feels right. Or to borrow an ancient word that the book uses twice, Nathan here makes rhyme righten. Please help me in welcoming Jesse Nathan. Thanks, Jeffrey. That was beautiful. Um, and, and thanks, Noah, and everyone for being here today. It's, uh, it's, it's really quite a sight to see all of you. Um, new faces, friendly faces. Uh, it's, it's a special uh, thing, this, this series. Um, I, I, I think it's fair to say that I grew up as a poet in this room, at, in this uh, reading series, Lunch Poems. So many amazing poets over the years um, that I got to see here. Uh, Robin Blazer, Safia Sinclair, Linda Gregerson, um, the list just goes on and on, um, and uh, Fadi Judah. Um, so it's, it's, it's really it, uh, amazing to, to take a place here at this podium and, and, and to be able to read from Eggtooth. Um, the book moves back and forth between Northern California and rural Kansas, um, like my life. Um, so the poems, um, go back and forth and I'll read, I'll read a few from these different worlds. Start with a straw refrain, which is a little song that opens the book, a song of a hot day, of, of losing your mind on a hot day. Straw refrain. Young gray cat puddled under the boxwood, only the eyes alert, oppressed to dirt. That hiss, the hiss of grasses hissing. What should, what should? Blank road shimmers. On days like this, my mind, you hardly seem to be. On days like these. No, no. See that sidelong silver drum? That hiss is a sigh of the propane tank. Two o'clock, you can smell it. Don't breathe that sigh. The creeks gone dry, summer as wide as the wildered sky, days like this, my mind, you hardly seem to be, straw frail, no breeze, you had a theory that the birds would silence on a day like this, but the mocker's keenness and the kingbird and the vireos commence to warble on as heat bears down a day like this, my mind, you hardly seem to be. You road, you creek. When I was small, the farmhouse that we lived in was struck by lightning. And if it uh, wouldn't have been so terrifying, it, it would have been exciting. <laughs> this poem is called Shock. As the storm moved in, I watched the night sky before I slept. A biblical clap woke the house to sprays of sheetrock, a powdered sprite springing from the nail heads, air flavored with ozone. In the hallway on the ceiling, a halo grew orange around a fixture, a glow. And dad on the phone downstairs, now shepherding the young ones out to shelter in the soap house. And mom, who's usually sharp as a crack, fumbling in the pandemonium at the extinguisher. So I, small and spry, some ways slithered in up the crawl space and find a burning fan. Not just that fire fanged attic fan. Wire floor, rags, even wall studs chuckle in those flames, a company that almost comforts until I gag on smoke or fear and jerk the pin and aim a sweep of foam, blonde as bone, until it's dark and I'm alone. Some say it was lightning in a mineral bisque that triggered first life. Grandpa said in 1933 he lost six head, his life savings, to one strike. And I, in the soap house later with an EMT, would sense in the rafters swallows, veer, loop, follow, as if a shadow 
had a shadow. In that corner of the prairie that my mother is from and, and which um, I landed when I was 10 years old with the rest of my family, um, the, the Mennonites, um, of which my mom is a, a descendant of, comes out of that community, um, still practice a ritual uh, called foot washing um, that goes back to biblical times. The idea being that you uh, might greet a stranger um, by washing their feet. And um, if you've ever had your, your feet washed, it's, it's a, a strange and intimate and kind of wonderful experience. And the idea is that, that if um, a, a group of people, a congregation practices this once a year or so, um, it might be a good way to begin to break down um, barriers uh, between different people. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's that tradition that gives, gives rise to this poem, Foot Washers. Stout as a dance hall, white clappered and square. It stood between fields, a short piece from town, bordered by gravel, a butt by God's acre, this roominess anchored by pews, through which wound mother in her special vamps and daddy in his monk straps to where a line of basins wait, warmish water lapping and the linen towels drape where feet of different walks have gathered foot foundered and fit alike for each soul to cradle, douse, and bathe their right hand neighbors, heel, instep, digits, found immaculate, or blooming lint, or faint funk, or toenail paint, foot loose, nail mangled, imp, most everybody's here. There's Auntie, who pronounces it pleasure as she communes with Sue, the drama coach, and uncle who keeps fake owls in the garden, who quizzes Tom, the sheriff, who's ticklish as he sprinkles his toes, and down at heel Justin, who yesterday hunted mallards up a slough, splays his shovels to a wing-tipped banker. And there, there I am, turning over a word in my head, catenary. Word for parabolas that fountains form. Word for the U a necklace makes. Curve an upside down arch as I towel off a sprouting cousin's fallen arches. Ankle bone, all 33 joints known and unknown that carry me away from home. Poem about leaving that place driving uh, and, and arriving in this, this place um, about that, that the, the, the way the land changes across that expanse of the Western United States. This is a poem also that um, makes some use of the fact that uh, the, the earliest human um, remains that archaeologists and anthropologists have looked at um, have tattoos on top of scars and so this is, if you draw rightly on a wound, it might righten. And so, and so they drive over arid floors of long departed seas and up with the land's ramp off the continental shield. They witness the mural of mountains emerge and they span the North Platte near the train bridge trusses, career in the wind boom of trucks, through basin, past bluff, straight through? No, no, they, they stop at a tattooist's hut. What for? Why, to mark themselves for themselves. Is it their first? Yes, and they, what is it of? He gets a barn swallow, she gets a spiral. Where? His shoulder, her ankle. And what do they mean? So many questions. I don't know, but ink as blue as bruises may be a kind of trust, sealed and believed. And does it hurt? Of course. It seeps with dewdrops of blood. Why did they do it? Charm? Armor? Maybe certain pain is meditative? Are they happy? Well, they have a long hug. And after that? They drive 
till they arrive at the city, soft sky, trees mighty, busy bridges festooning the night. <coughs> A lot of this book was, was written uh, while I was living in the Sunset District, which I always think of as kind of a, a beach town attached to San Francisco. <laughs> a different pace there, and because there are no major freeways, um, it hasn't um, gotten developed quite the same way. Um, and, and, and nearby was Golden Gate Park, um, the lung of the city, and I would wander around there, and, um, and, and this poem is a, a kind of postcard from the wonderful plaza that some of you, many of you probably know well between the Science Museum and the Art Museum. And it has a little epigraph um, from Cheslav Miłosz's poem, Bypassing Rue Descartes. I entered the universal, dazzled and desiring. Not a gathering, she says, a milieu. She'd made cake orange cinnamon with dates from a Tunisian recipe, and we savor it on a bench lulling with midday in a plaza of plane trees and fountains knee deep, while strangers of a mind to meander, meander. Milieu, she muses, from a term for medium, plus a word for place. This in the place of the dog who sighs asleep in equable sunshine of the ukulele variations in Over the Rainbow, of the elder who styles a baggie a glove to bust his Frenchie's ordure, of the checker spot breathing on the pollarded knees of a plane tree, of the shaggy lady who lives in this commons, these commons of sand and cement, all the voices and feet they've absorbed, all the rickety easels of nudes sprawled amid strollers, trikes, not a bleat of car alarm. She wiggles free of her shoes, remembers a coyote we've seen weaving through after dark on a beat, pausing in the band shell to sniff the concrete. The book ends um, on, a, on a poem that connects these two worlds by way of the telephone. And it's called This Long Distance. The other thing I guess I'll say is that um, I, I have heard recently that the Sutro Tower, um, when it was first developed, this um, radio tower in the center of San Francisco was, was reviled um, as a kind of blemish on the, the skyline. Living nearby it, um, I, I sort of had a, a different feeling. Um, there was something strangely um, I don't know, comforting is the word for that blinking figure, which appears in this poem, this long distance. Sunday, in his grandmother's time, had been the day you went visiting. Noontime news topped with beet borscht and pickled pig's feet, cottage cheese stuffed in pancakes and spudding, silly talk, and coffee. His art with his hopes had conspired to conduct him many states away, but even now when Sunday's here, he calls his kin. And when he'd call his parents, his dad would begin with weather. Five inches since Friday, seven and three-tenths since Monday. It may even hock up more. And his mother would inveigh or other times dial up other composings. First frost came, so we picked up the hoses, slid the barn door closed. Any minute now, we'll get fresh straw for the stalls. Or she'd say how they butchered the hens. One had a clot of new eggs in her ready to lay. Or she might tell stories of Aunt Larry, who never married and carried a snuff box. Or dad would describe having recycled faxes that had blankened. Each message returned to the ether. And then the sun might describe a minus tide or tell how his shoulder, tattooed, has haired over as if his swallow flies in a thicket. Or he'd ask, how low is the well? Or which kind of locust, again, is the swing tree? And so forth. They'd sneeze, cough, mention the soap house had had to be raised, or that cat the catamaran was trounced in a squall, or how their bodies were giving out an organ recital. 
they'd call it, and he, drinking coffee, might offer as balm the lights up the hills in the night in his city, described as the winkings of great piles of embers. And his mother might report on emerald leaves, emerald wheat, high leaning cloud banks. Or his father might say that the starlings were mustering the pasture. They could murder if they wanted. And the son, not really sure what then to say, says an iconic radio tower from where he sits presents like a comb jelly. And they, who in his imagination are in the dining room he knows well, hold up their phone up against the back window to let him hear the call, so personal and clear, of the train out there. A couple of very short poems about trees, um, one in the voice of a tree and one addressed to a tree. The Eastern Red Cedar is ind indigenous to Kansas. There's actually a piece in the Times today about how it's without the check of fire and the buffalo um, is, is now kind of taking over um, the prairie. Um, a green glacier, they called it, um, moving through the land. But it is rather hardy, and um, there's a particular old cedar on the farm, and this is what the cedar may have said. If I were half as free as you, I wouldn't droop, make faces of parchment, shed branches like phantoms, wouldn't hide a heart of soft scarlet. If you were half as free as me, you wouldn't go. You who leave not once like guests, but over and over like friends. and a California tree, Canary Island date palm, now a California tree. I couldn't say the dream I had last night, but I might start by saying your dates were motionless in a breeze, almost orange like bittersweet, almost yellow like bittersweet. An egg tooth, uh, as, as Jeffrey alluded to, is, is a, a bit of cartilage that forms on a baby bird's beak in the egg. And um, they use it, uh, it has one purpose, and that is to break out, break through that shell. Um, and and, and once, um, once hatching is completed, it disappears, it evaporates. Um, a figure that, that came to seem very important as I was uh, putting this first book of poems together slowly through the years, a figure for emergence. Um, and as this was happening, um, I was becoming obsessed with, obsessed by this seven line stanza that much of the book is written in, um, that, that comes out of John Donne's work. Um, and eventually, <coughs> fairly late in the process, it seemed to me that um, I was having a, a, a fairly direct, um, hallucinated conversation with Mr. Dunn. And so this is the title poem, Egg Tooth. And so at last spoke John Dunn's ghost, leaned up out of my book and nearly bit me. Seven, he says, sponsors creation, but also vice. Three and four holy, but three marks the rooster's count. His face was gold pounded thin. I say, use me like an egg tooth. Break the shell that shields you. Let me be the germ hoarder of calcium, the bulb of sharp caruncle, expression of beak, of horn that makes a toothlet to snout thrust, a barb to barb what's chipped away by the very thing maintained and encased. Enamel glaze grades the puncturer's tool. So draw your breath by drawing a hole. Use my imbalanced device, half medieval, to shuck frank death as you surge with goodbye, as you fast and breathe and pay, supposing the face a blade sustained to sing 
and to fly. The metaphor, the framing that often uh, gets deployed um, in, in, when talking about the, the middle part of, of this country, that vast expanse of, of prairie, um, is one of emptiness, flyover country. Um, and it's that same story that has been used for many centuries now to justify things like um, colonizing that land, um, this, this sense that, well, it's empty, we, we'll, we'll improve it, um, we'll fill it. Uh, and, and that story um, began to bother me more and more. And, and, and the, the poem that I want to read now and, and leave you with um, is a kind of dissent uh, on that story. Um, there's, there's really so much if you get close. Um, the other thing that, that began to happen as I, as I worked in this um, rather constricting stanza was that a, a, a kind of free verse voice um, was also uh, pushing its way out. Um, I, I grew up in the free verse tradition. Um, and so this is a poem in which that uh, collision is in some ways, I think, mirrored in the, the interactions between the, the grids that European settlers brought to the prairie and the meandering movement of the streams, which follow their own logic. Um, and uh, th the world of, of, of those two places um, collides all, all across the, the prairie, but it, it, it's especially visible in a strange way if you follow the, the creeks. And sometimes I would uh, wander along the creek beds and um, it's a different world there because it's, it's outside of the human, um, the settled human area. Um, the, the, the turtles are enormous. The, the wildlife has a kind of abundance um, that makes me think of places like uh, the, DM, the demilitarized zone or uh, Chernobyl, where uh, left to, to its own devices, nature has claimed this space. So um, that th those move through the prairie. It's, it's called a prairie woodland. And it's a kind of between world. At one point, I thought the book would be called Between States. So much of it is, as, as Jeffrey pointed out, um, between, between Kansas and California, um, between the prairie and the woods, uh, between my Jewish heritage and my Mennonite heritage. This is between states. And the, the little epigraph is walking the creek springtime. I'm remembering it took 20 minutes for the local firefighters to reach us the night the lightning got the attic blazing. Long enough to take a bath. I'm remembering as the road grader growls by somewhere, its unremitting blade leveling the sand of a road, bunched and rutted, stopping the land from taking it back, stopping it in the language of a straight line. And I'm remembering how someone used to toss bush light empties down our crushed limestone drive, thrown from a passing pickup, cans silver glossed, azure and partially crushed. Imagining the hush of the creek bed in winter's crust, ice sounding off. But it's April, and April is stinging nettles, sneezeweed and terse breezes, wide awake skies, vein blue tulips. I'm remembering a rainstorm mudding the road, even as I pedaled home, left the bike, ran soaking through fields, following the lips of the waterway that appeared articulate, weirdly lit up in lightning. Imagining Roma, my grandmother heard, in the pasture as a child. They would canvas the farmhouse, barter for milk. At dusk, the calls of their children. Imagining people before that who tracked this route, maybe camped on these banks, fished, called out to a friend, a strategy or result, could eat what they caught without second thought. I'm remembering the placard in the half ring of fading pines off Old 81, describing a people who must have had scores of words for Zephyr, people who, say the translators, could sing, my children, when at first I liked the whites, my children. When at first I liked the whites, I gave them fruits, my children. A people whom the white government sent surveyors to, to establish a trail's way through these parts. My aunt used to sing, when the prince wants an apple, he takes the tree. 
and the envoy arrived in the grass sea to wheedle the Osage and the Kaw, offering $800 and a few saddles for a promise of permanent free passage, local trapper as translator, he the best they could scare up, his Kaw sketchy at best, and I'm imagining my relatives soon flooding in with cabinet and poppy seed, bonnet and spring tooth, hope chest and hedgerow, their book full of martyrs, dear as a mirror and quilts made in the drunkard's path by hands that wouldn't hold a drink, obsessed and kind selectively, women and men, enough of whom must have believed when they were told to hallucinate a past, to quell a present, told these are the gardens of the desert, these the unshorn fields, boundless. In blank verse, it was home to a race that long has passed away in a forgotten language and old tunes, all is gone, though the actual act of emptying was actually still happening. Even as they set to plowing, that first time like plowing a doormat, the sod rent open with a sound like a zipper, harrowing, reaping, shocking, threshing, which is to say, by 1846, the caw were penned in reserves, by 1873, pushed out of state, and by 1876, boundaries, forced marches, monoculture, my foreparents by the powers are granted swaths of so-called open land to open up, and I'm imagining, first of all, much water under no bridges, the streams like this, they would have seen foaming with fish, peppered with turtle, an opus of bird song they'd have heard, and maybe heard also of two men who set out from the northeast border killing 800 wolves before they reached the Smoky Hill River. And I'm seeing buffalo, 10,000 killed in one hunt in 1882 by men with sharps as I watch a black bull corral the herd in the paddock I'm threading through, whose hump is a massive, whose head is low so his body's like a road grader. The droves rambunctious and nervous as they quick march. They must have heard me in the underbrush, or they've heard and seen this gleaner, road-bound dust comet traversing one of these little concrete lime and clay bridges that's all the speaking these roads and creeks are wont to do with one another. And when it's gone, and the cattle gone, and the air cleaner, the quietude I think not strange and empty, the creek not foaming with dace, but cocoa brown with topsoil, the ground greened over by recent rain, a clown-faced cloud somersaulting slowly as a contrail punctures her nose, plain proving a scratch that dissolves on the cosmic glass, frail trace of cities. I'm down here, imagining the chaff, in the air of olden times, and a people, my mothers, who must have believed the line that these contours were theirs to grid, grounds theirs years before they landed this gift outright, blank, still unstoried, artless, unenhanced for the taking, like a creeper takes that cottonwood by the ears, takes what it wants, while still giving an impression of peace to a poet having a sit before he blunders on with his eclogue passing not through a prairie, not through a woodland, but through a prairie woodland, technical term for this band of life, woods along streams, surrounded by oceans of grass. I'm remembering the way flying in, the creeks seem to cross the gridded lines, the roads like veins over graph paper, which natives and settlers relied on, spotted afar, to locate what water there was among networks of vines and tough shrubs that clinch these muddy lips, this mustache of canopied verdure running a few feet on either bank, a curt succession from love grass, drop seed, blue stem, to great big trees rising from abominable desolation, said Auden, where nothing points, though it happens to be home to lady slipper and pheasant and kingfisher and windmill grass, and what are states to them? What are states to bobcat and nitrogen-eating bacteria and dung beetle and race runner and sunflower? to carpets of sorghum, beans, cornfields replete with large centipedish machines, woodland, a slender band of betweenness whose meandering logic seems but is not whimsy through the subsoil. Of course, this state already had a song, had reverie, had chants going forth, like how the Pawnee would sing before battle. Let us see, is this real? Let us see, is this real? 
Let us see, is this real, this life that I am living? I'm looking where a log points, a slippery log that makes its point over the real froth as I waver between real banks to the real knob the trunk lands upon, this land of lightning bug and common gray moth, of the misnamed prairie dog, not canine, but squirrel, the meadowlark, not any kind of lark, the horned toad, not toad, but spiked lizard, the jackrabbit, truly a hare, the prairie chicken, truly a grouse, the locust, a false acacia, even the buffalo were really a species of bison, but in their crush to have and sow the place, I can picture the settlers' faces and sometime glee as they attach their names to things like catlinite, pipestone, maroon erratic, tracked in on the feet of glaciers, crushing spruce forests used and called what by first peoples for carving pipes, fine-grained, soft, picked up by my loner grandmother, who'd pick over roadsides, scour the gravel drive for wheat-sized, one-celled fusilinids, searching them out as if divinities slept in minerals, in chips of meteorite and shark teeth. And I'm remembering that it wasn't the land that carved me apart, but a system of culture, a school of flack from an elder if you couldn't pull a straight furrow, whose term for the leftover corners of wheat left standing at the cambered angle of a turning combine's path was Jews. I'm remembering someone saying he hadn't done his Jews yet. And I'm imagining the neighbor in a case hat, sweating as he forces the waterway in his field to flow straight, trenches out the curves, tautens the meander to get a few more acres of arable land. Plow the dew under, went the old saying, meaning get out there early and turn the soil, a culture of extraction displacing itself, its sports teams called the pipeliners and the threshers, the wells failing, the farms drying up, the schools consolidating, and I'm remembering mine was a school of milk all over my locker, of laying tacks on an outcast's chair, the usual cruelty with a rural edge, remembering that I, who got kicked in the spine, had my own complicities in the unstated contract of freaks for export only. All that projected emptiness. Only the land was always a solace. I recall it as I crossed now under a bridge at the bend in the road that was a town called Empire, erased, felt one newcomer to the prairie, blotted out, I've always loved that unroomed vertigo, a sky that swallows you. And I hear again the grader hacking somewhere back around the section, his angled blade a balm to the quadrangles party, which gave us passable roads and the persistence of windmills. He's following the lattice work his ancestors laid over branchings of stream and river, which look from above like leafless trees or paint peeling or like cracks in a wall eternal prairie and grass with occasional groups of trees. Fremont prefers this to every other landscape, Charles Proust wrote on their way to taking California. To me, it's as if someone would prefer a book of blank pages. And always, I want to linger in those pages. But I'm imagining the tension between singing and the journey. Remembering people I knew who worked red eyes at the hatchery in the nearby town, who'd brag of killing runts in creative ways, knocking them to slime, Candace, Carmen, and the hacker boys, figures grown up with who don't know what figures they seem for whiteness and sex and bored destruction. I'm remembering some uncle saying, best not to marry on the other side of the creek. But I say a border is also a world. Zone of cottonwood, hackberry, luxurious weeds towering in scarcely a human presence, a golden haze where monarchs lunge and bounce in private liberated gloom that must from above look like giant interlocking hooks. I'm imagining the Bobo Lynx view, who flies with the aid of the stars, how a month ago the stream was ice, how an hour ago a mare was stretching her neck over barbed wire fences for the sweeter grass. And I'm imagining these stinging nettles in my path electrify my shins, imagining my stanza standing for the grid within me while my lines run on like creeks across pastures beneath a huge sun of remembering already halved by the line of the land, land half imagined, half vanished as a fog comes not upon the earth, but out of it. Thank you.
Oh, wow, what music and what control, Jesse? Um, a vein on graph paper. I really, oh, that was a hell of a performance. Um, if you want more symphonic monody, I encourage everyone to pick up Jesse's book. Pegasus has it in the back there. It's really, it's really an achievement. Um, on your way out, if you want to sign up for our mailing list, there's a sign up sheet over there. Um, we'll be convening in February for Courtney Faye Taylor, uh, which will be our next reading. And if you want to review this reading or any other Lunch Poems reading, we have uh, an active YouTube archive. Um, thank you all for being here today. Buy books. Thank Jesse. Thanks to the library. And thanks to you. Um, and thanks to Bob Haas, our founder, who's in the audience here today.